Yes. Welcome to Up In Your Business with Kerry McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show offers listeners first-hand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and informative weekly blog, where you'll read and comment on life as wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. I'm Carrie McCoy, and like Tim said, it's time for me to get up in your business. By that I mean to say, share business knowledge and wisdom with you, our listeners. For the next hour, my guests, fellow entrepreneurs with an unusual twist and connection to my nonprofit Dreamland Ballroom, we are going to share our knowledge with you today on philanthropy, preserving art, and the Brewer Art family which has three generations in Arkansas. Today we'll be discussing how we maneuvered the path of philanthropy, leadership, and entrepreneurship in pursuit of our dreams. Now, you may be asking yourself, what qualifies this lady to do this? And I'll answer, is easy. It's experience. I started my company, Arkansas Flag and Banner, over 40 years ago. During the last four decades, Arkansas Flag and Banner has grown and morphed from door-to-door sales to telemarketing to mail order and catalog sales and now relies heavily on the Internet. Each change in sales strategy required a change in the company thinking and procedures. My wisdom, confidence, and my company grew. My initial $400 investment now produces nearly $4 million in annual sales. In this next hour, you will hear a candid conversation between me and my guests about real-world experiences of service, determination, and luck. Today's topics will be about the family legacy of artist Nicholas Brewer and their contribution to Arkansas and our country, about how to preserve your private art or other precious property, and last, about an upcoming free event at Dreamland Ballroom next Thursday. Becoming an artist or starting and owning a business is like so many things. It takes persistence, perseverance, and patience. I worked part-time jobs for nine years before Arkansas Flag and Banner grew enough to support just me. It's now grown and expanded so much that to operate efficiently, we require, are you ready for this? A purchasing, manufacturing, graphic, shipping, technology, accounting, marketing, sales, and customer service department, plus a retail store. Twenty-five people make their living from working at Arkansas Flag and Banner. My guests today are Larry Graham and Ann Bryan, two entrepreneurs who are here to talk in part about their business and how it relates to the famous Arkansas artist Nicholas Brewer, Adrian Brewer, and Edwin Brewer, and about the upcoming art show featuring Edwin Brewer's eight oil-on-canvas paintings called the Santa Barbara Jazz Exhibit. The art show is next week in the Dreamland Ballroom and open to the public. Larry Graham is many things. He's founder and president of Graham & Associates, a financial planning and investment company, where over the years he has received many awards from his industry and peers. Recently, Soray Magazine named him one of the best insurance agents in central Arkansas. He's a former secretary and treasurer of Friends of Dreamland Ballroom, the nephew of artist Edwin Brewer, the grandson of artist Adrian Brewer, and the great-grandson of artist Nicholas Brewer. And my personal favorite, 20 years ago, Larry ran and completed the Boston Marathon. With Larry today is Ann Bryan, co-owner and conservator of Bryan and Devon Conservation, which specializes in cleaning and preserving art and other historical items. They are members of the American Institute of Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. Like Larry, she too is many things. A clinical instructor at UCA, teaching courses such as History of Architecture, Interiors and Furnishings, and Historic Preservation. She holds a Master of Science with an emphasis in Curriculum Development in Historic Preservation and Restoration. She is on the board of directors for the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Arkansas chapter. She is chair of the Polly Woods Scholarship Subcommittee, and she is a retired pharmacist. That's got to be a good story. I am happy to announce that she and her husband, Jim, just recently joined the Friends of Dreamland board. Welcome to the table, Larry and Ann. I'm out of breath on those. Good afternoon, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Larry, you have in your personal and private collection 
many of your ancestors' paintings. And, Anne, you have helped Larry clean and restore some of his collections. Can you tell me how you two came to meet each other? I got a call from Colin Thompson at uh, the Cox Center, and he had a piece that needed some restoration. And I went over to pick it up, and Larry was there with him, and that's how we met. So you got a call from who? Colin Thompson at the Cox Center, Cox what? Creative Center. The Butler Center, and they're, they're part of CALS, the Central Arkansas Library System. I gotcha. And they have a bunch of the Brewer family. Uh, they families. have quite, uh, quite a number of brewers. Uh, the last time that um, I, I saw a list that Colin had prepared for me several years ago, uh, there were in excess of, I think, about 60 brewer paintings that have been donated by uh, families from all across Arkansas. Uh, so it's quite a collection. So people are donating their paintings? Yes, people are donating, also gifting. Myself, along with my two brothers, we just recently gifted a, a very large landscape that my grandfather had completed. The landscape was actually painted down the Arkansas River by the Big Bluff. I think it was completed back in the 1930s. And my mother and her husband, Peyton Rice, had acquired this painting some time ago. And then after my mother uh, passed away several years ago. It was our decision to gift the uh, painting to Colin and to the Butler Center. So we can were anybody happy. go down to the Butler Center and see? Any? Yes, they can. It just recently was restored. I cannot think of the people that restored it, but it's a beautiful canvas with brilliant colors, a lot of reds, blues. The cottonwoods that are still down there on the Arkansas River are part of the landscape of the painting. So we were just very, very happy and pleased that we gave this to the Butler Center, and they in turn uh, were very delighted to have it. Larry, do you paint? Stick figures. Stick figures. I I did attend. uh, My uncle had a studio down in the old boys club years ago. In fact, years ago, I was probably nine or ten years old, and I did attempt to learn how to paint, but I just didn't have that talent. You're a much more cerebral guy. You're a financial planner and investor and an insurance agent, so you took that path. Yes, by mistake, but I've been doing this for 44 years, and I've had uh, a lot of successes and, and fun. So it's always challenging, but uh, I enjoy meeting with other people and, and helping them plan their future. I didn't really put in the list today to talk about in my preparation to really talk about your company, but if you've got something you want to say about it before we delve into the Brewer family Well, history. we basically, I'm a very small company. I work with other advisors, but uh, basically it's our intent and our mission to help others plan for their future with regard to certain strategies, whether it's in their business or it's personally. We like to really kind of take a snapshot of where their current plan is and then make recommendations based upon what their goals are. So I really enjoy uh, the entrepreneurship in my industry and working with all, you know, different, uh, different folks from different walks of life, business owners, contractors, uh, real estate agents. So it's been a good journey. What did you go to school? Uh, I went to Hall High, graduated there in 1970, and I went on to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and graduated in 1974. With a degree in? Uh, Bachelor of Science. Oh, yeah. you both have a Bachelor of Science. All right, I think this is a good time to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to learn more about the artistic Brewer family's legacy, not just in Arkansas, but nationally. Great-grandfather Nicholas and your grandfather Adrian, Adrian both have paintings that were commissioned by the White House. They were commissioned. They were commissioned. My great-grandfather Nicholas was commissioned to paint uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Of course, there were other artists during his four terms as president that were also commissioned, but uh, the portrait that my grandfather painted was actually in the White House for a few years, and then it also uh, was located, I think, in one of the Senate chambers or Senate conference rooms. And we're going to talk to Anne about the do's and the don'ts of preserving your art and your other precious items. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with Larry Graham, president of Graham & Associates, and the ancestor of the famous Nicholas Brewer family of artists, Anne Ann Bryant, co-owner of Bryan and Devon Conservation. Larry, it's time to talk about your family in depth. Let's start with Nicholas Brewer. When did he live? Well, uh, Nicholas... Late 1800s, uh, right? Well, it's late 1800s, and I believe he died in 1947. He had a good life. Uh, His wife uh, was Ruth, and they had five sons. And I can't think of all the sons other than, uh, of course, my grandfather, Adrian. Uh, Reuben was another brother. Edwin who my uncle was named after, Edward Brewer, was the illustrator of all the cream of wheats. No. Uh, yes. 
Well, so to, so, but let's go. You're going you're to confuse our listeners okay. if we jump all the way from Nicholas okay. to Edwin. So let's okay. do it in order. Let's do Nicholas first. Okay, we'll go Nicholas, then we'll go, go Adrian. Then we'll go Adrian, and then we'll go Edwin. Nicholas uh, was born in Minnesota, outside of the Twin Cities. He traveled to New York City, had quite a few trips over there, actually had a, uh, a studio located in New York. But during his uh, travels, he was commissioned by quite a few of the residents in uh, the upper echelon, if I should, for lack of better terms, that lived in the Twin City areas. And so he painted many, many portraits that are now, uh, and most of them are in private collections, and several of them are located uh, there in the Twin City areas as well as throughout the, uh, the Northeast. Are any of them in any big uh, museum? Well, um, I think I you know, some of his the, well, there's some, of course, in the museum up there in St. Paul, Minnesota, the the uh, larger museum, and I cannot think of the name of yeah, it. And I, I apologize, but no, that's fine. Uh, he also has some, some exhibits in the um, in the city of New York. Uh, I'm not sure of the galleries that they're located, but it's difficult to find many of these, like it is for my my grandfather, and my uncle, because they're all in private collections. And the only times these really appear is when somebody should should die. We have an estate sale, and all of a sudden you come across a, a valuable classic brewer that was basically commissioned by that family to have my grandfather paint, say, an uncle or a father or a grandfather or whatever. And he was a portrait painter. Basically portrait, but he did That's why they stayed in it. families, because it was a family member he painted. Well, it wasn't so much a family member. It was members of, of you know, some of the stat, the higher status folks that, that lived in those areas, uh, governors, lieutenant governors. Chief Justices, uh, like I said, uh, FDR. Also painted Joe T. Robinson, which... Uh, Did he actually paint FDR? Yes, yes. He, my gr- great-grandfather painted FDR. Is it the one that's in the White House? Uh, it was one that was in the White House. And that one, again, I think it's one of the, one of the Senate conference rooms in, oh, in, in the National Capitol. But and then he painted Joe T. Robinson. He I didn't painted Joe T. Robinson and Mrs. Robinson. And those two paintings were outside one of the entrances into... The Robinson Auditorium, and then I do not know where they're located now. I've been to the Robinson Center now, the one that's been renovated, but I, I don't know where those paintings are located. Now, how did he end up in Arkansas, or did he end up in well, Arkansas? Well, uh, my grandfather, Adrian, traveled with his father, Nicholas, and they traveled down to Arkansas painting basically landscapes. In a boat? They may have traveled in a boat. I don't, don't know. know. It may have been a, back then it may have been a covered wagon or probably a car. When they came through Arkansas, uh, they stopped and had an opportunity to meet some of the people here, the, some of the wealthier established folks here in Little Rock, and uh, painted quite a few portraits or commissioned to paint portraits. And then from here, they traveled throughout Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and painted a lot of landscapes there. And so they were really a father-son team. They spent a lot of time in Texas. In fact, my, my grandfather, Adrian, painted the Blue Bonnets of Texas, which there is a, actually one of the Blue Bonnets that he did uh, paint is located in the uh, Butler Center. My grandfather, he won an award for this particular painting that he did, Landscape. In fact, at that time, it was like the most prestigious award that you could get, you know, in the art community. When was Adrian born? So okay, I can get a- Adrian was born in the 1920s. And, so this was um, probably in the 40s, or that he was. Well, no, he, yeah, he it was, yeah, they traveled. They traveled in, in the 30s and 40s together. And upon one of their trips to Arkansas, they were in Hot Springs, and that's where he met my grandmother. And so they started courting, and they not Nicholas, but Adrian. Adrian, my grandfather, yeah. and uh, thank you, Carrie. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they got married, and then uh, they had three children: Edwin, and there was Adrian, his twin brother, and then my mother, Betty Rice, Betty Brewer Rice. They did so much traveling, but then they got tired of doing all the blue bonnets and landscape in in, uh, in Texas, and so they moved on to New Mexico, and in Arizona, and they've done some completed some beautiful works out there. Basically, landscape works. So Nicholas never really lived in Little Rock. Or in no, Arkansas. no, no. Nicholas really didn't. He stayed in Minnesota. But and because Adrian met your, met my grandmother, met grandmother, then he decided to make Arkansas his home. Did they uh, live in Hot Springs or Little Rock? No, they lived here in Little Rock. They lived really in the Hillcrest area. Lived there for quite a few years. And then he died uh, in 1956, and my grandmother never did remarry. But the uh, you know the passion that my grandfather had for painting. Uh, and the landscapings and the colors and the richness of so many of his portraits. Uh, Sharon Freike is a friend of mine, you know, the Freike family, and 
Uh, she has a beautiful portrait of her grandfather that uh, that my grandfather had had painted. That was quite. Uh, so your great grandfather was Nicholas, who painted Roosevelt and was yes. a portrait painter. And well, then his son was Adrian, who also was a portrait painter. Right, and Adrian was uh, was commissioned, and I cannot think of the congressman, but was commissioned to paint the. Uh, the American flag uh, prior to the start of World War One, what's going to be World War Two, and um, so anyway, this painting is called the Sentinel of Freedom. Which, Carrie, you know what that looks like? It's the faded looking banner. Vert- fl- yes, yeah, the flag. And in the back, painting. in the background, uh, it kind of looks like Petty Jean. That every single solitary classroom in when I was growing up had this picture in it, and I have three at Arkansas Flag and Banner. And when Larry came in years ago and said, "My grandfather painted that," I was like, "No, he did yeah. not." Everybody has this painting. Well, it, it, it's an interesting story, simply because he was commissioned to to paint this and. Not knowing that, of course, the United States was going to be entering war in December '41. It also, along with the schools, it was in all the ships during the war. And it's a beautiful canvas that is now uh, located at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. It's also part of a traveling show throughout the United States uh, by the United States. Uh, it's probably the most famous painting of, any of the American US, flag. The American I, w- flag I would say so. And, and to kind of carry that forward, uh, John F. Kennedy liked it so much, being a Naval Academy graduate. He had it hanging in the White House for a short period of time, and then he was going to dedicate that to the library in Annapolis. And, in fact, my mother and Adrian's widow and my younger brother, Lou, and I were heading up to, or were to head up to Washington in December of 1963. And, of course, we know what happened in November of 63. So that trip was postponed until, like, February of 1964, and we did attend the dedication at that time. And all the, the big brass and a lot of the politicians were there for the presentation of the flag to the Naval Academy. So Adrian Brewer, who passed away in 1956, and his widow, but before he died, his wife and him started the Arkansas Arts Center? Well, it's, uh, right? it's kind of, that's kind of fuzzy. It was called the Arkansas Arts League, I believe, and that was really the predecessor to the Arkansas Arts Center. And also my grandfather, Adrian, and my uncle, Edwin, started the Mid-Southern Watercolors Association, and that was back in, I think, the late 19, uh, mid-50s, late 50s. So they were one of the founders of the, the Mid-Southern Watercolors Association. Did his wife continue it? Uh, no, not really. I think uh, several years after that, it uh, with, with Rockefeller's help, uh, Governor Rockefeller turned into the or converted over to the Arkansas Art Center as we know today. And I heard that Adrian was responsible for starting the Artmobile. That was one of uh, Winthrop Rockefeller's projects, and uh, I remember very uh, clearly my Uncle Ed driving this 18-wheeler all around the state to all the various schools and putting on these art shops and workshops. And So uh, it wasn't Adrian that started the Artmobile. It was Adrian's son, Edwin. Now we're getting closer to the current days. Yes. So Edwin yes. was the son and a twin right. of of Adrian. So we've got Nicholas, Adrian, and now Edwin. Right. And Edwin is the person that you're close to. And if we start talking about him too much, Larry will start crying because he, he was like a father to Larry. Well, he was. We, we had a very uh, special relationship. And I've been fortunate enough to, to go out to Santa Barbara after he moved out there in 1979. And I've been going out there every year since. And so it's got a really, really deep place in my heart. A lot of so it was Edwin, your uncle, my uncle, that started the art mobile, not Adrian. Well, no, not Adrian. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just spoke okay. there. Ed, no, yeah, Ed, Edwin. Yeah, and Edwin was asked by Winthrop Rockefeller to be in charge of the art mobile. And Edwin, did he do portraits? If he did, I'm not aware of those. It was basically landscapes, still life, watercolor, as well as oil mediums, basically a lot of landscapes. He used to restore paintings a long time ago and travel throughout the state working with various private collectors. Well, that's really, that's a legacy of artists, isn't it? Is anybody in your generation an artist? Well, in my generation, we we do have a few. My cousin, Audrey Wood, is illustrator of children's books, along with her husband, Don. They have been nationally recognized throughout the country as one of the top writers of children's books and they um, and she is the daughter of she's edwin. the daughter of edwin yes. and edwin didn't he write an elementary book for school about how to well i i don't know if it's an elementary book or not and i'm not real clear on that subject I mean, it's a good question carrie but 
Uh, he did write, I think, like the pamphlet or something like a yardstick to go by for public schools to use, and it's still being used to this day. Isn't that amazing? So his daughter is kind of following in the illustration yes, of books. Yes, she is. She illustrates and writes children's books. And, uh, in fact, their books have been uh, translated in more than 20 different languages around the world. In my travels to uh, Austria, to New Zealand, to Australia, to Europe, it's been one of my passions to go and look, seek out a bookstore and see if I can find some of the brewers, the children's books, and I've been very fortunate to find those. Oh, you're collecting them. Well, I'm collecting them, and then just to search them out. Now, before we went to break the last time, you told me that somebody in your family did a book, and I said, well, save that till we come okay. back. What was that? Okay, Trails of a Paintbrush that was uh, written by my grandfather, Nicholas Brewer. What was Trails of a Paintbrush? It's basically a... It's a storyline of their travels, of oh. my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Uh, it's no longer in publication. However, I was contacted by a uh, artist friend of mine up in the Twin City areas that is now writing a new book on the Brewer generation. Wow. You've got a lot going on in your family. You've got to be extremely proud. They're like the Lewis and Clark of America painting. I don't know about that. I do know one thing, that in the obituary when my grandfather died, he was uh, recognized or really mentioned in his obituary that he was the father of Arkansas artists. And so that was a nice tribute to him. And so your grandfather, Adrian, mm-hmm. stayed here, lived in Hillcrest with his wife till he died in 1956. And his son, Edwin, who was your uncle, who you were very close to, stayed in Arkansas while you were young. Mm -hmm. And then when did he leave Arkansas? He left uh, in the mid-1970s to join his, uh, you know, join his family, Audrey and uh, and Don, and uh, Evan had two other daughters. And they had moved out there, gone to school or something? Well, they just moved out there and made California their home, and so they wanted to be closer to them. So when he was out there is when he began to paint some portraits of this jazz series that's going to be shown yes. in Dreamland. Yes. And it's probably a good time to take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk with Anne about the do's and don'ts of preserving your art. And we want to come back and talk about Edwin Brewer's art, the Santa Barbara jazz series that he did. But we're going to save that to last. You're listening to Up in Your Business with Kerry McCoy. I'm speaking today with Larry Graham, president of Graham and Associates, and the ancestor of the famous Nicholas Brewer family of artists, and with Ann Bryant, co-owner of Bryant and Devon Conservation. Ann, it's your turn. Okay. How did you go from a pharmacist to a teacher to owning your own restoration company? I usually tell people that I fell down and hit my head, (laughs) and when I woke up, I was something different. (laughs) My first degree was in pharmacy. I went to UAMS and practiced for 12 years. And our health care model here in America is quite broken. And I didn't really enjoy it like I thought I would. And so I decided to change careers. So I went to UCA and got another bachelor's and a master's, mostly due to historic items. I'm a historic preservationist. I live in a historic home in a historic neighborhood, and I just enjoy all things that are old and tell some sort of historic story. Because I believe that's when where our real history in America lies. It's not in really memorizing the dates in the textbook, but knowing who the people were that made the history. Oh, that's nice. Old men, old money, old liquor. (laughs) Old whiskey. (laughs) So what did you not like about pharmacy, and how long did you do it? I practiced for 12 years, and like I said, our -hmm, our health care model here is broken. And so I spent a lot of time on the phone arguing with health insurance companies. (laughs) Because they didn't want to pay for the the medicine? That's correct. (laughs) And I just felt like patient care suffered due to how our system is set up. I've always kind of been an armchair historian our my family always talked about our family history and read lots of books and it's just kind of always been a part of my life and I guess I just didn't really know when I graduated from high school that I should have taken another path (laughs) I think that's true of everybody or a lot of people there's very few people that know right off the bat what they're going to be when they grow up we often talk about how you should probably take a 
gap year or two in there so that you can kind of work around and see what you like and then go back to school. Right. Now that you're a preservationist, what do you preserve? I know you preserve art because you cleaned up and preserved Larry's family's art. Right. Buildings. <laughs> Buildings? <laughs> yes. Um, houses. I've, I've done uh, two houses of our own. What does that mean? Our farmhouse in Clark County was built around 1855 and was condemned. And so you bring it back so you can live in it. So you researched the restoration designs of that time? Right. The period look. Mm -hmm. And then you try to seek out products that would work in today's world and create that same look, I guess. Right. And a lot of the buildings, we call it reading the architecture. So you can go in, and even if it's been manipulated through the years and turned into something different, there's still enough, generally, fabric in the building that you can read it and see where the staircase really was or where they took a wall out or added a wall or added a door or something like that. And so you can kind of walk around and just say, I know that wasn't there because... You learn how to read the architecture of the house. So I've always enjoyed the Quapaw Quarter area, and so we moved down there 21 years ago and then found this 1855 farmhouse outside of Arkadelphia and purchased it for a dollar. <laughs> wow. That's like the Taborian Hall. All right. It must have been in really bad disrepair. Oh, it was terrible. You yeah. can stand in the front yard and look completely through the house and see the back. That's yard. a real shotgun house. Y- it, yes. <laughs> I, I do a lot of historic preservation in that area, research on buildings and things like that, and then also mostly paper-based objects like art, maps, old documents, old diplomas, that kind of thing. Paper is so, very fragile. It is. And How do you a preserve lot of it's full paper? of acid, so you have to deacidify a lot of it so it won't crumble and fall apart. So we've talked age. about how to restore a house. How do you restore paper that's falling apart? Because uh, I just gave you some. Yes. <laughs> and what we're going to do to so yours. tell me what you're going to do to it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to tell the audience a, a blueprint of when it was the USO, your when, building. When the Dreamland Ballroom was mm-hmm. a USO club. And it had been rolled up and all of the edges are really damaged and so what we have to do is put it in a humidity chamber and very very slowly unroll it so we don't break any of the paper fibers there was one project i worked on that it took three months to stretch out a wadded up piece of paper (laughs) so you do that get it flattened clean it get the acid out of the paper and then you can do the repairs on it. So you have a big dehumidified room that you put things in? Yes. Mm. We have a great HVAC system in the studio. And then what do you do to preserve it? Put it behind glass? Generally, or we can encapsulate it in archival that material that's, for lack of better explanation, a, a thick piece of plastic, but it's archival. And so you can encapsulate the piece so it's not exposed to the environment or humidity. Do you want it not to be exposed to air, or do you want it to be able to breathe, what you put it in? We put a little breathing hole every time we encapsulate something. You just want a little bit of air. I gotcha. So when you restored oil paintings for Larry, how do you do that one? Little tiny brushes? Well, uh, yes. (laughs) Lots of little things. Um, A a bit of kind of a wool pom-pom. And we probably went through hundreds of those, <laughs> cleaning that seems, those. That seems counterintuitive. <laughs> wool pom pom. I guess wool's not very scra- Is it? It's not. I'm thinking steel wool, but you're talking about cloth wool. Yes, yes. Like yeah. lamb's wool. I got you. And um, it's like a cotton ball of wool almost. Yeah, okay. kind of like that. Okay. You start out with the least abrasive thing, which is usually a distilled water, and you do a tiny test on it somewhere where. You know, you make sure that the paint's not going to come off or do any further damage. And then if it doesn't come off that way, then you slowly increase. And what are you trying to get off? Dirt and grime and grease? Yes. Uh, Tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke. Yeah. And and smoke from a fireplace. Those are really 
very attracted to canvas for some reason, and we've had paintings brought in that we thought were sepia paintings. Oh, yeah. And then once we got the tobacco off, they were very brightly colored underneath and could hardly recognize it. Shield them from all kinds of smoke and chemicals, direct sunlight, that kind of thing. Direct sunlight, I knew, would fade anything pretty quick. Mm -hmm. It will watercolor especially. Some pen and ink, you know, usually a, a room that you don't have a lot of bright light or direct sunlight. You can Not display close your to stuff. a fireplace. I have signatures. <laughs> yeah, I have a lovely handwritten note from Dale Bumpers, one of my heroes. He's just a great guy, and I want to display it, but I'm afraid it's going to fade away. You could use conservation glass. I give it to you. Sure, we'll do it. <laughs> I just have it in a drawer, and I have another one from Hillary Clinton. Uh huh. And I'm I'm afraid to put any of it up for anybody to see. Yeah, uh, conservation glass helps uh, the UV rays not come through the glass as much, and then you would need to hang it in a place where it wouldn't get a lot of direct light. So being a preservationist, you must have some pet peeves. I know that it drives me crazy when I see people tearing down old buildings or see people going in and modernizing an old, really wonderful old structure with architectural wood that's you just can't get anymore, and they'll just go in and tear it out and put in something modern and new, and that really eats at my soul. I, I dream about it and fret over it. So yeah. I've even cried over buildings that got torn down. I'm with you, sister. <laughs> what mistakes do you see most people making? So we just talked about buildings. Putting tape on anything. Oh, uh-oh. Don't tape anything together. <laughs> put it in a plastic bag. Don't put it in a cardboard box or a folder or... Really? No, because cardboard has acid in it. And it's okay to put it in a plastic baggie? Temporarily until you can get it conserved. So, like, what I have is just stuck in a drawer. Right. Is that okay? Probably not, because if it's in contact with other paper, the other paper has acid and it'll it, seep on What about over. if it's in contact with photographs? Because um, your memorabilia drawers are full of photographs and papers and... Right. All that stuff your kids are going to have to throw away when you're dead, and they're going to hate you for it, but you think somebody's going to want it, so you're saving it? Yeah, yeah. You should separate them. Okay. <laughs> I always learn so much on my shows. Is there any other business like yours around? I don't think so. On the AIC webpage, we're the only ones listed in Arkansas. What's AIC mean? It's the conservation. Oh, the, your member of Yes. It. So you just always loved being preservationist mm -hmm. you've bought a house in Arkadelphia that's an hour away yes so how do you manage buying a farmhouse that far away doing your job up here and getting contractors down there that aren't going to spray paint something that you're trying to preserve or they're being unsupervised where they're doing construction well I had how a, you a fabulous that? architect Tommy Jameson and a fabulous contractor Dave Gonyer it was easy to do that when they moved the house. Actually, the architect went down and wouldn't allow me to go down there because he knew it would make me really nervous. <laughs> he knew you'd cry? <laughs> and it did get kind of stuck in a ditch for a little while when they were moving it. To, what do you mean they moved it? It's not yeah, in Arkadelphia anymore? No, it is. We just had to move it away from, it was right on Highway 26, where a truck could just barely miss the curve and take it down. So we moved it to our 23 acres, which is just right across and kind of up the hill. So we didn't move it very far, but we did have to move it. Do you go down there and spend time in your house? Just was down there last week. So it's a vacation home kind of now, just out in the middle of the woods. My husband hunting. likes it for hunting. I'm with you. <laughs> now, I would redo a farmhouse for a hunting home, that's for sure. So talk to us about teaching. You've become a teacher yes. at UCA. Yes. And talk to us about how that came about, because you've now got your business Right. You're teaching and you're restored a farmhouse. <laughs> she makes me look like I'm a kindergartner, all right? At the time that I started teaching at UCA part-time, I was at Hawker Beechcraft Aircraft designing the interiors of small jet aircraft. And I was there for about 10 years. And they needed somebody that they knew 
knew something about history of architecture and that kind of thing. So they called and asked if I would teach a night class. And so I did that every semester for six or seven years, something like that. And then a full-time position came open, and I applied for it. And Did you know you liked to teach? No, actually, both of my parents were teachers. My mother was an elementary school teacher. My dad was a college professor. And, you know, after hearing their horror stories, I thought, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) And here I am. But it's college. Yes. Uh, And you're a professor, you said? I'm a clinical instructor. That's my title. So of all the things you do, which one do you think is the most rewarding? Oh, I don't know how to, I don't think I can answer that. Oh, all right, don't answer it. Yeah, you might have somebody listen, your students will be like, she didn't say teaching. So you are. Well, they all have their own joys and they all have their own frustrations and they're just different. You are multifaceted and it probably takes a lot of different things to fulfill your needs to do stuff. I am kind of like that too. You want to do a lot of different things and so you probably would not be satisfied doing one thing all day. Do your eyes hurt after you work in your restoration business for very long you wear special glasses uh, i have a big magnifier and um very tedious yes you can work on an inch of a painting for two hours (laughs) easily if it's you know needs a lot of work oh that's right up your alley larry (laughs) wouldn't that make you go crazy (laughs) Yes. No. So let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about next week's art show in the Dreamland Ballroom. It will be the first time these eight oil canvas paintings of Edwin Brewer's Santa Barbara Jazz Series will be exhibited, along with some paintings from Larry Graham's private collection. Both Anne and Larry will be there to give any tips to anybody about how to preserve things. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with Larry Graham, president of Graham & Associates and an ancestor of the famous Nicholas Brewer family of artists and Ann Bryant, co-owner of Brian and Devon Conservation. All right, let's tell everybody the story, Larry, of how the Edwin Brewer's art came to Dreamland Ballroom. You've got the whole story for everybody to know. These are the paintings that are going to be shown this Thursday after work from 530 to 7.30 in the Dreamland Ballroom. And Larry was the facilitator that got them to the Dreamland Ballroom. And I bet the Butler Center's wanting them right now. Well, Davis Strickland and Colin Thompson. Oh, from, from the Butler from Center. From the Butler Center will be there. I love it. And the good news is is that two of Edwin's daughters who live in the Eureka Springs, Ed, Edwina and um, Jennifer, will be coming down next Thursday for the So Edwin named well. his daughter Edwina? Yes, Edwina. That yeah. is so cute. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's cute. There was a jazz bar located in Lower State Street in Santa Barbara. That's kind of the main thoroughfare that connects with Cabrillo Boulevard. Full of shops, bars, places that you can go, a lot of eateries and restaurants. But this jazz bar was quite unique. It was at the lower end of State Street. And it had a platform there where the jazz musicians or musicians would come in and have a jamming session. Or they would have some formal musicians in there for weddings and what have you. And so the problem with the bar was that it had these huge walls. And there was nothing on the walls at all. And my Uncle Ed would frequent this place quite often. In fact, I would go and have coffee with him as well on numerous trips I I made out there. But anyway, he approached the owners of the bar and asked them if he could put together a a jazz portrait, if you will, and wanted to decorate these walls were just, they were all bare. And so he wanted to, you know, paint these jazz performers in a way that would really brighten the the jazz and the conversation pieces and those sort of things. So this part of my uncle's life, really, he pushed out of what his comfort zone was because he was basically painting in palettes, with palettes and knives and, you know, straight line things and did a lot, you know, landscapes and still life and people of all walks of life. And so there was this lady that he met that taught up at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and her name was Irma Cavat. And uh, she was a real strong individual, and really she bucked the headwinds of the university. And the university really thought that conceptual art was the way that all painters should paint. And so with that said, she asked Ed to bring brushes, big, huge brushes, to her classroom and push himself 
and express himself with all different colors of the two paintings. And so my uncle, in his own uh, in his own way, he'd started painting these huge canvases of these jazz musicians. Uh, the first one that I recognized when I first went out there to the jazz bar was uh, the scene in New Orleans of the funeral procession, which was the large campus, the canvas that we just recently got, and that is quite unique. But he really was so enthusiastic that this was a, a new medium for him. I mean, he got away and got out of the shell that allowed him to demonstrate his new artistic found passion to really uh, put these jazz paintings on canvas. So anyway, you know, we talk about State Street, and State Street, again, is the, one of the, it's the hangout in Santa Barbara, but State Street in Little Rock. And so when my wife Cindy and I were in Santa Barbara last year, and we were sitting and we were visiting, and they were telling us about the jazz art and how Ed, right after he died, the jazz bar finally closed, and then he gave the jazz art back to, to Don and Audrey. And so visiting with them on our trip last year, they decided, hey, this would be a great gift to the Dreamland Ballroom because jazz, Dreamland is jazz. And Goes together. Here, here's Edwin, jazz. And so my cousins, Don and Audrey, decided to to gift these paintings and give them to the Dreamland Ballroom. And it's the first time that they have ever been shown here in Arkansas. So we're, we're certainly excited with that and excited that the Dreamland Board decided to move forward and, uh, you know, take these paintings under their wings and have them exhibited in such a, a wonderful historic building. I would like to say one thing uh, here, just a plug for Ann. She and her staff and Laura cleaned about a dozen of my Brewer paintings. And for those of you out there in the listening audience, I would certainly recommend her company because they do magnificent work. They're very tedious. You about you have to be very patient because it's not done overnight, but I'm just plugging in in there. But Larry, Dreamland cannot thank you enough. Well you know and what's really interesting about it is State Street is in Santa Barbara on State Street yeah. where they were painted. Yes. And they're coming back to Dreamland Ballroom on State, State Street, Street in yeah. Little Rock, Arkansas. How ironic is that? I know. And another interesting thing is my father's name is Edwin. The painter is named Edwin, and my son's name is Edwin. So I just feel like there's a lot of synchronicity in this whole gift, and it's it's just lovely. Thank you, Larry. I want to be sure and give a shout-out to your wife, Cindy. Today is your one-year anniversary. Yes, it is. She's flying back from San Diego to celebrate her anniversary. That's very nice. One year ago, they were getting married in Santa Barbara, and I was that when you texted me about the paintings? Yeah, thereabouts. Okay. So this Thursday night, if anybody wants to see this really special event, it's May the 4th. Come after work from 5.30 to 7.30. It's a free art exhibit, and a lot of people are dying to see the Dreamland Ballroom after the documentary, and it's not open to the public all the time. So this is a great opportunity for everybody to come down. And the Brewer Art is not open to the public all the time either because we're working on where to place it and how to keep it temperature controlled. So this is going to be one of the few times you're going to get to see this Brewer Art and see the Dreamland Ballroom, and it's free Thursday night, May the 4th, from 5.30 to 7.30. Tabriz also is having their big hot dog night, so you can kind of make it an art walk night. You can come by the Dreamland at 5.30, you know, get a glass of wine, look at the Brewer Art, then go on down to the Tabriz and make another night down there. And this is for you guys, for all y'all do, and for birthing your business. (laughs) It's a cigar from the Humidor Room at Colonial Wine and Spirits on Markham. Yes, for birthing your business. I don't know if y'all are going to smoke them together. Or what? You can br- hey, bring them Thursday night. Yeah. I'll get one. No, we'll smoke it together. No, we can't smoke close to a painting. And we can't yeah. smoke in the Dreamland Ballroom. We'll stand Thank out on end. the sidewalk. <laughs> That's right. That was one of her big rules, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. Who's my guest next week, Tim? Next week is going to be Alan Leverett of the Arkansas Times. Oh, he's one of my all-time favorites. You know, he's a farmer, too. He's a second-generation farmer. He lives on a farm. He's got a lot to say. He's always got a lot to say. And he used to own a bar when he was young in North Little Rock. He's an entrepreneur all the way also. So if you have a great entrepreneurial story that you would like to share, I'd love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info to questions at upyourbusiness.org, and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me. If you think this program's been about you, you're right. 
but it's also been about me and the dream I have. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or lightning, and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next Friday. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about UIYB, go to flagandbanner.com and click on Radio Show. Like us on Facebook or subscribe to her weekly podcast wherever you like to listen. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. Underwriting opportunities available upon request. Carrie's goal is to help you live the American dream.